that will determine ako na ako. Nanginginig ni Nix. So, is book one and two of the criminal law, right? So, we go first to some of the important definitions and uh, rules with regards to criminal law. Criminal law is a branch of public law that deals with crimes, treats of their nature, and provides for their penalty. It is a branch of public law because it deals with the relationship of the offender with the state. Whenever a person commits a violation of a penal law, it is more of an offense against the state than against the private offended party. Whenever a person commits a violation of the law, there are two injuries produced. One is a social injury against the, against the state for the disturbance of public order. And the other one is the personal injury against the victim or the private offended party. When a person commits a violation of the law, he commits a crime. Crime is an encompassing word. Crime includes a felony, an offense, and an infraction of the law. So crime refers to an act or omission against a law, forbidding or compelling it to be done. It includes the word felony. Felony, strictly speaking, refers to acts or omission in violation of the revised penal code. Offense refers to an act or omission in violation of special penal law. And infractions of the law refers to an act or omission in violation of an ordinance issued, passed by the local sangunian. So this all of these, whether it is a felony, an offense, or an infraction of the law, they are all under the word crime. So crime is an encompassing word referring to all of them. In the Philippines, it is the legislative department that has the power to enact penal laws. This power of Congress, however, to enact penal laws is not absolute in nature. It is subject to certain exceptions. And they are, first, penal laws enacted by Congress must be general in its application. Otherwise, it will be violative of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. Penal laws enacted by Congress must not be in the nature of an ex post facto law. Third, penal laws enacted by Congress must not be in the nature of a bill of attainder. And lastly, penal laws enacted by Congress cannot impose cruel or unusual punishment or excessive fines. These are the limitations on the power of Congress to enact penal laws. 2016 bar exam distinguished an ex post facto law from a bill of attainder. Two points. An ex post facto law is a law which makes an act criminal, although at the time it was committed, it was not yet so. Whereas a bill of attainder is a law which penalizes the accused without giving him due process of law without giving him the opportunity to be heard, without giving him the opportunity to be tried in court. So that is the distinctions between an ex post facto law and a bill of attainder. There are three characteristics of criminal law. We have the so-called generality, territoriality, and prospectivity. The generality characteristics of penal law refers to the persons on whom the penal law is required to comply with. Whereas, the territoriality characteristic refers to the place wherein our penal law shall be applied. And lastly, the prospectivity or irretrospectivity characteristic refers to the time the penal law shall be enforced. So first is generality. Under the so-called generality characteristic of penal laws, our penal laws shall be binding upon all persons who live, reside, or sojourn in the Philippines regardless of race, creed, color, religion, and other personal circumstances. So whoever you are, whether you are a Filipino citizen or a foreigner, for as long as you are here in the Philippines, regardless of race, color, religion, other personal circumstances, you have to comply with our penal laws. Otherwise, for violating it, you can be prosecuted before Philippine courts. The generality characteristic of criminal law, however, is not absolute in nature. Based on the generally accepted principles of public international law, heads of states, sovereigns, and other diplomatic representatives are immune 
from the criminal prosecution before the country where they are assigned, where they are situated. Therefore, these sovereigns, heads of states, and other diplomatic representatives cannot be prosecuted before the courts of the host country. This is known as diplomatic immunity from suit. They are immune from criminal prosecution, from punishment, under the said laws of the said host country. Except, exception to this is the so-called consul. A consul, although a diplomatic representative, is bound to comply with the laws of the host country. If he commits a violation of the laws of the host country, he can be prosecuted. He does not enjoy the same diplomatic immunity from suit enjoyed by sovereigns, ambassadors, and other diplomatic representatives. If, however, the act done by the consul is in relation with the performance of his functions, then he can also be immune. Likewise, if there is a treaty between the mother country of the said consul as well as the host country, accepting the said consul from criminal prosecution, then the said consul cannot be prosecuted before the courts of the said host country. X and Y got married. X and Y met in Holland. X is a Filipina. Y is a, Filipi y is a Holland citizen. So the wife is a Filipina. The husband is a Holland citizen. They met in Holland. They got married in Holland. The woman X gave birth when the said son was only six months old. Six uh, yes, six months old. They applied for a divorce. The courts of Holland issued a divorce decree. Upon this, uh, after this divorce decree, the Filipina, the wife, went back to the Philippines. They said Holland citizen husband, former husband, remained in Holland or Netherlands, but promised to give support to their young boy. Later, years later, the said husband, the Holland citizen, came back again to the Philippines and settled in Cebu. He found another woman and got married with the said woman. The former wife, X, was also in Cebu, and X learned that her former husband has found another woman, married woman, and, and they are now engaged in a very fruitful and successful business. And so this former wife sent a demand letter to the husband asking support for their son. But the husband refused to receive the said demand letter and would not give even a single centavo of support for the said young boy, which he promised to give before. And so the said woman filed a case of violation of RA 9262 against the husband for his unjustified failure to give support to the said minor child. The argument of the husband, first according to him, is not bound to comply with RA 9262. He is a Holland citizen. And under their laws, he is not obligated to give support to their children. To their children. Second, according to him, being a Holland citizen, he is not bound to comply with our penal laws. Are his arguments correct? His arguments are wrong. They have no merits. In so far as the first argument is concerned, the said Holland citizen argued that based on their Holland laws, he is not obligated to give support to their children. Although he invoked the Holland law, he presented no evidence as to the said law. Therefore, based on the doctrine of processual presumption, it is presumed that their law is just the same as Philippine laws. He is obligated to give support to children. Second argument also has no merits. The second argument has no merits because based both on the generality and territoriality characteristic of Philippine penal laws, since he is living in the Philippines, and since the crime of failure to give support happened in the Philippines, continuously happening in the Philippines, therefore he is bound to comply with our penal laws RA 9262, otherwise he becomes liable under said law. What if the ambassador of Japan was in the Philippines after a um, courtesy call to the president 
which lasted until 7 o'clock in the evening, this ambassador of Japan went to a private party. In the said private party, he had drinks, he became married, and thereafter he went home. On his way home, however, he was the one driving the car. He would not want his driver to drive the car. On his way home to the hotel where he is staying, he was driving recklessly and he hit a, and bumped a pedestrian. The said pedestrian died. It was discovered he has no license. And so, the said ambassador was prosecuted for reckless impudence resulting in homicide. Will the case prosper? The case will not prosper. Being an ambassador, a diplomatic representative of Japan in the Philippines, he enjoys blanket diplomatic immunity from suit. Therefore, for any act committed in the Philippines, the host country, he cannot be prosecuted. But what if it is the Consul of Japan who, after talking with the President until 7 o'clock in the evening, thereafter went to a party? a private party. And thereafter, the said consul on his way home, driving his own car, hit and bumped a pedestrian. The said pedestrian died. Can the said consul of Japan in the Philippines be prosecuted for reckless impudence resulting in homicide? He can be prosecuted for reckless impudence resulting in homicide. Although he's also a diplomatic representative, he does not enjoy the same diplomatic immunity as sovereigns, ambassadors, and other diplomatic and other diplomatic representatives. He is bound to comply with the laws of the Philippines, it being the host country, he being assigned here in the Philippines. Failure in his part will make him be liable under our penalties. The act that he did was not in connection with the performance of his official functions. Therefore, he can be prosecuted for reckless impudence resulting in homicide. The other exception to the generality characteristic of criminal law are the so-called laws of preferential application. These are certain laws which accept particular individuals from criminal prosecution. The best example of this is the 1987 Constitution under Title VIII, which provides that our members of Congress, whether senators, or members of the House of Representatives are immune from criminal prosecution for libel, slander, or oral defamation for every speech or debate they made in the halls of Congress while Congress is in its regular special session. This is known as Congressional Privilege of Speech and Debate. This is an example of a law of preferential application which exempts member of Congress from criminal prosecution. Then we have the so-called territoriality characteristic. Under the so-called territoriality characteristic of our penal laws, our penal laws shall be enforced only within the Philippine archipelago, including its atmosphere, its interior waters, and maritime zone. So for crimes committed outside the Philippine archipelago, our penal laws cannot apply. There are, however, exceptions to this as provided for in Article then we have the so-called prospectivity characteristic. Under the so-called prospectivity or irretrospectivity characteristic of penal, of penal laws, our penal laws shall only be applied prospectively. Our penal laws as a rule cannot be given retroactive application. Therefore, it shall take effect only and may be applied only from the time of its effectivity and henceforth or forward it cannot be given retroactive application. Exception to that, we have two exceptions. First, under Article 22 of the Revised Penal Code, it is expressly provided that penal laws shall be given retroactive application if it is favorable to the accused, provided the accused is not a habitual criminal. So penal laws can be given retroactive application if it would benefit the said accused the said convict, except when the said convict is a habitual criminal. Second exception, when the special penal law itself provides for its retroactivity. Example of that is under RA 9344. Under RA 9344, the Juvenile Justice and Welfare Act, Section 68, 
this special penal law expressly provides that this law shall apply retroactively. Therefore, here, it is the law itself that states for its retroactive application. So these are the two exceptions to the prospectivity or retrospectivity characteristic of penal laws. So again, the characteristics are generality, territoriality, and prospectivity. There are two philosophies underlying the criminal law system. We have the so-called classical or juristic philosophy, and the other one is the so-called positivist or realistic philosophy. The characteristics of the classical or juristic philosophy are as follows. First, the basis of criminal liability is human free will. This philosophy believes that man is a social creature who understands right from wrong, good from evil. And therefore, when he does a wrong, he does so knowingly and willfully. Second characteristic of the classical philosophy, the purpose of penalty is to exact retribution. This philosophy revolves around the maxim, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. For every crime committed, there is a corresponding penalty. Third characteristic of the so-called classical philosophy, the determination of penalty is done mechanically. That is, every penalty, for every crime committed, there is a commensurate penalty. The penalty to be imposed on the offender is in direct proportion to the injury that he has inflicted on the victim. If the said accused, if the said offender killed the victim, his penalty would also be death penalty. The death penalty is a product under the so-called classical philosophy. The last characteristic of the classical philosophy, the emphasis of the law is on the offense, not on the offender. The, the emphasis of the law is on the crime, not on the criminal. The classical philosophy doesn't take into consideration the reason why the offender committed a crime. It suffices that he committed a violation of the law and for that he has to be punished. So those are the characteristics of the so-called classical or juristic philosophy. On the other hand, the characteristic of the positivist or realistic philosophy are first. The emphasis of the law is the I mean, The basis of criminal liability is non social environment. This philosophy believes that no man is born evil. What makes man do evil things is the influence that he gets in his association with the social environment with his fellow beings. Second characteristics of the positivist philosophy, the purpose of penalty is reformation. This philosophy believes that every criminal, every person has violated the law is a socially sick individual who must be reformed, cured, rehabilitated, not punished. Third characteristic, the determination of penalty is done individually on a case-to-case -case basis after the said individual or offender has been investigated. And then we have last characteristic, the emphasis of the law is on the offender, not on the offense. The emphasis of the law is on the criminal, not on the crime. This philosophy takes into consideration the motive, the reason why the offender committed the crime. If you mix both the characteristics of the classical philosophy and the positivist philosophy, we have the so-called eclectic or mixed philosophy. Under the so-called eclectic or mixed philosophy, crimes which are social or economic in nature shall be dealt with in the positivist or realistic manner. Whereas crimes which are heinous in nature shall be dealt with in the classical manner. We go to some principles, theories, and rules in criminal law. The first among this is a so called utilitarian or protective theory. This was initiated by the Supreme Court in the case of Magno versus CA. Under the so called utilitarian or protective theory, the purpose of penalty the purpose of punishment in criminal law is to protect society from actual and potential wrongdoers. Hence, courts, in imposing the penalty, must see to it that these penalties are only imposed on actual and potential wrongdoers. And Supreme Court said that even in cases of violation of special penal laws, where in criminal intent is immaterial, courts shall see to it 
that penalties or punishments are imposed only on actual and potential wrongdoers. The reason behind the, the utilitarian or protective jury is the maxim actus non positrium nisi mensitri. That is, the act is not criminal when the mind is not criminal. The other important doctrine is the so-called doctrine of pro reo. Under the so-called doctrine of pro reo, penal laws are always liberally construed in favor of the accused. Our penal laws, our criminal laws, the RPC and special penal laws shall always be construed, interpreted liberally in favor of the accused and strictly against the state. Reason behind this doctrine, the constitution of presumption of innocence. Every accused is presumed innocent unless proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Then we have the so-called lenity rule. Under the so-called lenity rule, whenever a penal provision or whenever a law is susceptible of two interpretation, one interpretation is lenient to the accused and will give rise to an acquittal, and one interpretation is strict to the accused and will give rise to a conviction, the lenient interpretation shall prevail over the strict interpretation. Same reasoning, that is, it is based on the constitutional presumption of innocence. All persons, the accused, are presumed innocent unless proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Then we have the so-called equipose rule. Under the so-called equipose rule, Whenever the evidence of the prosecution is equally balanced with the evidence of the defense, the scale of justice shall be tilted in favor of the accused. Two reasons. First, constitutional presumption of innocence. And second, in any criminal prosecution, it is always the state, the prosecution, that has the burden of proving the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt. The conviction of the accused will depend on the evidence of the prosecution and not on the evidence of the defense. So when the evidence of the defense is just equally balanced with the evidence of the prosecution, it must be unacquitted. The scale of justice shall be tilted in favor of the said accused. Nulong crimen nula pina sinelege. There is no crime when there is no law that defines and punishes the act. So no matter how pervert, how heinous, how immoral an act a person has done, if there is no law that defines and punishes the said act, the said person cannot be prosecuted in court. The only jurisdiction of the court is to dismiss the case. There is nothing to hear because there is no law that he has violated. The Philippines is a civil law country. The Philippines is not a common law country. Common law countries, the European countries. In common law countries, acts which are immoral through the passage of times becomes punishable act. But in the Philippines, that will not happen because the Philippines is a civil law country. In our country, penal laws are enacted, passed by Congress. Therefore, unless and until there is a penal law that punishes an act, the said act cannot be punished or cannot be prosecuted before the so those are some of the preliminaries to the revised penal code. We go first, we now go to the RPC proper under Title One, Article One I mean. The revised penal code took into effect on January 1, 1932.